So let's begin by praying. Oh Jesus, you stepped into our world. You spoke into our lives. You opened the door to eternity. And as we reflect on what you did and said tonight, I pray that your spirit would um, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, that we would behold wonders in your law. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen. Right. I thought to um, use for the Bible study John chapter 7, and reading from verse 25 to 44, the reading on coming up is from 37 to 44, but I thought to have the first part as a bit of a background. Um, what had happened was they were having the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, and Jesus' brothers had said to him, oh, aren't you going to go up to the feast? And you've got to be in Jerusalem for the feast if you want to be noticed. And he said to them, you go on up, up ahead. I'm not coming just yet. And he went up later. And for most of the, the festival, he um, remained in the background. He was present, but no one, he didn't speak, stand out or speak up or anything. And everybody was asking, where is he? Isn't he coming? What's going on? Um, and it's interesting as you read that to realize that um, it is probably quite easy to to remain inscom inconspicuous at that time if you just dressed like everybody else and kept your face properly covered etc people wouldn't easily recognize you and so Jesus um, went through most of the feast and then um, uh, about halfway through the f festival he started um, speaking in the temple and teaching the people and everyone was amazed at what he was doing and what he was saying uh, and so we pick it up sort of midway through and so reading from verse 25 at that point some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask isn't this the man they are trying to kill here he is speaking publicly and they are not saying a word to him have the authority Authorities really concluded that he's the Messiah, but we know where this man is from. The, when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me and you know where I am from. But I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him. But I know him because I am from him and he sent me. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Still, many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowds whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? We go where our people live, scattered among the Greeks, and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, 
he is the Messiah. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Reading for us tonight. Um, Jesus was in Jerusalem for the festival, which was the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, it was one of the great feasts in the Jewish calendar. And uh, it was one of those festivals where every uh, male was expected to go to Jerusalem, whether they all did or not, I have no idea. But I think Jerusalem filled up considerably. It was also a seven day festival. Um, and then on the eighth day, there was a celebration. And it came at a time at the end of the harvest. Um, and so they had the, the harvest festival. Um, and I gather that in uh, rural um, and in farming communities, harvest festivals are times of great joy. You've, you've got the harvest in, and particularly if it's been a good harvest, You've got it stored up. You've got, um, it's like payday and everybody is celebrating. It was also a festival that uh, reminded people of their traveling through the wilderness. They were expected to live in, in booths or, or tabernacles or little um, structures of some kind. And I think we see it around the area even today where just before the Feast of Tabernacles, many people put up little structures in the garden with uh, uh, palm branches covering them. Um, and that was what was expected of the people. And what it was doing was reminding them of the goodness of God to the people during the um, journey in the desert. And so you had this um, very, I expect very positive, upbeat uh, situation in Jerusalem with lots of people, uh, great celebrations going on, um, and Jesus stands up in the temple and begins teaching the people. And clearly, he taught um, quite differently to everyone else because people hung on his words um, and, and they recognized there was something different about him. And so in the, the beginning of the passage, we read, as the people of Jerusalem, we're not sure which people those were, whether that was the crowd later on, it was the mob that called for him to be crucified or not, we're not sure. Um, uh, it's a term that is only used one other place in scripture, in Mark 1 verse 5, which is again just talking about the people of Jerusalem. Um, uh, and whether it was only Jerusalemites, or whether it was all the people that were in Jerusalem at the time isn't clear. I suspect it was everybody that was there. Um, and they began questioning, who is this person? Here he is speaking publicly, um, and there's, there's clearly something about him. They begin asking, aren't, isn't this the one they are trying to kill? Um, so clearly the word was out that Jesus was not popular with the authorities. Uh, it wasn't the crowd that was trying to kill him, uh, but the the authorities. And we know that um, there were a number of people that uh, would follow Jesus, but weren't doing so too publicly because of fear of the Jews, because of the fear of what would happen. And so the, the word was out that Jesus was um, under threat from the authorities in some way. And the people listening to Jesus um, and noting the fact that the authorities weren't doing anything about it begin to question why isn't this happening? They have a price on his head essentially. And here he is in the temple day after day, busy teaching, <clears throat> and they've done nothing. 
And so they put two and two together and say, have the authorities concluded that he's the Messiah? Are they actually uh, leaving him uh, and they're not trying to stop him because uh, they've actually recognized who he is? And so it's almost as though they're saying that maybe the, the authorities are giving them him their tacit blessing for what he's doing. Um, and then it raises the question, how can he be the Messiah? And this interesting little verse, um, but we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. And there was a, a discussion at the time and, and two ideas within Judaism. The one was that the Messiah would be from Bethlehem because he was a descendant of David. That was clear. And therefore, um, uh, the Messiah would, would come from uh, Bethlehem. And that's then raised later on in the passage. There was another strand of teaching in, in Judaism which said that the Messiah would just appear and no one would know where he came from. The Messiah would just suddenly be there. And so the people are saying sort of with that strand of teaching, uh, we know where he's from. Therefore, that rules him out as a Messiah. Uh, and Jesus picks that up as he as he responds to them. Uh, sorry. And th they say, we know where he is from. And yet clearly when you, when we read later on that, they say, this man's from Galilee, therefore he can't be the Messiah. They didn't actually know where he was from. They just probably knew him as the Galilean carpenter or the preacher from Galilee or um, whatever. They, they didn't actually know his story. Um, and then Jesus stands up and says, you know me, uh, but I'm not here on my own authority. Um, and it is the authority of Jesus was one of the questions that was raised time and again as you read through the, the, the Gospels. You think of the number of times the Pharisees come to him and say, by whose authority are you doing this? Who gave you that authority? Um, who says you can do this? Because they hadn't licensed him. He didn't have their approval so who said he could do this? Um, and as we read their uh, perspective, one understands they're trying to sh shut him down, trying to stop him, trying to say that he, he, he shouldn't be speaking. Um, and Jesus says that he, he's not there on his own authority, um, but he has been sent. Um, and he's quite clear about that. He who sent me is true. Um, and tells the people, you do not know him. They don't know God. And it's not just that they don't know who sent uh, Jesus, uh, that that's a mystery, but that the people at the time didn't really know God. And one can see that time and again where they misunderstand him and they misapply the law and they, they have the, the wrong perspective. Um, he's saying, you don't know him, uh, but fortunately he says, I know him, I'm from him, and he sent me. And Jesus, knowing the Father, was able to reveal the Father to us. Um, uh, and later on in John's Gospel, he, he says quite clearly, I and the Father are one. <laughs> so um, he says to Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you, if you know me, then you know the Father. And so Jesus comes from the Father um, with the Father's authority, doing the Father's will, in revealing the Father um, to us. And it's interesting, as, as, as he says this, that just highlights how time and again, Jesus depended on God. He, despite being God himself, despite being part of the Trinity, he spent time with the Father. He spent time praying. He, he, say, and he says here, so I, I'm come from him. I'm, I have his authority. Um, and he says elsewhere, I've come to do his will. Jesus wasn't doing what he wanted. He didn't think, oh, and nowhere did it come across as, well, I'm also God, therefore I can uh, do what I want, what I think. He was constantly deferring to what God had said, what God told him. Um, and it's really just a challenge to us as Christians to, to constantly be, deferring to God and to be taking our lead from the Father. Um, 
which we have in scripture. If Jesus did that, uh, we need to do that all the more. Uh, we're told at verse, verse 30, at this they tried to seize him, uh, uh, but no one laid a hand on him. Uh, and we're not sure exactly who it was that tried to seize him because it's only later that the, the scribes and the Pharisees send the temple guards to arrest him. It might have been some of the other teachers standing there. Um, and we're not sure how John knew that they wanted to, to seize him or try to seize him um, and what prevented them. It might well have been that they were, were standing saying, you can't let this carry on. Let's, we'd better arrest him and take him and a lot of talk about it, but nobody actually doing anything. Um, or else people coming to arrest him and as they get in front of the crowd, suddenly confronting Jesus himself plus the crowd all hanging on his word, waiting on him, thinking, oh, this is a bad idea and backing down. Um, but he wasn't uh, arrested or seized at that point. And we're told that it was because his hour had not yet come. It wasn't just that uh, they were powerless, he was too powerful, the crowds prevented it, it was the wrong time. And it just underlines the fact that Jesus was here with God's purpose according to God's plan and God's timing. And this wasn't the time for him to be arrested, so he wasn't. It just didn't fit in with that. And this notion about the hour, the appropriate time for things, comes through quite strongly um, in John's gospel. And he mentions it a couple of times. Uh, just take you through some of them, if I can find them. That is, um, uh, in John chapter two, right at the start of Jesus' ministry, at the wedding of Cain in Galilee, his mother comes to him and says, oh, they've run out of wine. And Jesus' response is, he says, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. So Jesus recognizes a time for what he's doing. That wasn't the time. Uh, later on in John chapter 12, uh, Jesus says in verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Um, he recognizes the time is, is right. And a bit later in that same chapter, verse 27, uh, Jesus speaks and says, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. So he recognizes this is the time for that to happen. Uh, in chapter 16, <clears throat> Jesus uh, speaking to the, to the disciples at the Last Supper, says a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each of you to your own home, uh, and you will all leave me all alone. Yet I'm not alone, for my Father is with me. And again, he's saying this time is coming. There is a time when this will happen. And then in chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus prays, and he, uh, we're told after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. <clears throat> and Jesus saying at that point, the hour has come. This is the hour. And that was the, the he went from there to his arrest to the cross. Um, and so this uh, story where we are happened quite a way before that. And nobody would arrest him because it wasn't the right time. And Jesus would know when the time came. Um, and despite people wanting to arrest him, we're told many in the crowd believed in him. Uh, uh, this crowd, probably pilgrims from around the country, from various places in the world, listening to him, watching him, hearing what people said about him, seeing what he did, uh, recognized this must be the Messiah. And their reasoning is when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? And that's just saying, isn't this exactly what we expect from the Messiah? Um, and the signs that, um, that you're referring to are probably, probably some of the miracles, which John describes throughout his gospel as signs. 
um, when you go, if you go back to chapter two, uh, the uh, turning of water into wine, John says this, the first of Jesus' signs. Um, and so Jesus is caught, uh, John recognizes the miracles are signs that Jesus does, which point to the reality of who he is and what he's doing. Um, and very often the miracles John quotes underline the teaching that Jesus has been doing. And so Jesus speaks about uh, uh, people needing to, to walk in the light, needing to see properly, and saying, I am the light of the world. And with that, John has a number of uh, accounts of Jesus healing blind people <clears throat> as signs of him being the light. And the, rec the, the crowd recognizes <clears throat> that what Jesus was doing, what he was teaching, surely that, that underlines the fact that he is the Messiah. Having said that about the signs, it's also interesting as you read through the chapter, that there are no great signs recorded. There's a lot about what Jesus was saying and about his teaching. Um, the fact that he was teaching in the temple courts, it was what he was saying and his word to the people, that was the important part, which is wonderful because that's what we have today. If you have the story of Jesus going and, and uh, healing 500 blind people and 200 cripples and all these other things, all we'd have today are the stories of it. We wouldn't have seen it. It wouldn't have been an experience. Um, they'd just be stories. But Jesus teaching that he's the light of the world. Um, Jesus um, challenging people about the, the gospel and the, the, uh, the covenant and the Old Testament. And we have all of that teaching. Uh, and so we can know him and follow him more easily. And then the crowds, with the crowds saying, surely he must be the Messiah, the Pharisees decide they need to do something. Uh, the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. So it's, it's an interesting uh, uh, story and uh, situation where Jesus is pup, but a whole lot of the discussion is furtive around him. There's not a great public debate between Jesus and one of the Pharisees about the Messiahship. Uh, they, at this point, it's still fairly furtive and the, the people are wondering and, and the Pharisees hear what the people are whispering. Um, they hear the rumors and they decide, oh, we'd better do something. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent the temple guard to arrest him. So they come, uh, and we know that they don't arrest him. They join the crowd, and they don't actually uh, arrest Jesus while they're there. And we're, we're told, let me just quickly get to it, that they went back not having arrested uh, him, and the Pharisees asked, why not? Uh, we're told if, from verse 45, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked, why didn't you bring him in? And their response was, no one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. And so uh, clearly Jesus' teaching have, was having an impact, not just on the crowds that were whispering, this must be the Messiah, but the temple guards who go to arrest him also get caught up in it and, and recognize um, and see through it who he is. Um, the Pharisees uh, refuse to listen and their response to them is you mean he's deceived you also have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him no but this mob that knows nothing of the law there's a curse on them um, and so uh, the Pharisees didn't have Jesus arrested uh, despite the uh, the gods going to, to him Jesus then points forward to his his mission. He says, I'm with you only a short time, and then I'm going to the one who sent me. So it's clear he's on earth. When his time is done, he's going to the one who sent him. And we know from what he said earlier, he talks about going back to the Father. Um, and you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Which 
on a straightforward, uh, simple level is, is true. If Jesus has gone to heaven, we can't go to heaven. We, we're stuck on earth. But as I read that, I suddenly thought uh, the deeper truth here is that no one can go where Jesus is going. He says, where I am, you cannot come. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how well we keep the law. It doesn't matter what brilliant good works we do. It doesn't matter how wonderful anyone else thinks we are. We cannot go where Jesus has gone because none of us is perfect. Um, and so the fact that Jesus opens the door for us, gives us his righteousness, uh, imputes his righteousness to us, draws us into heaven, that is a privilege that we have, and that is the grace of God. It's not something we cannot do it ourselves. Only God can do it. Um, the crowd certainly don't read that into what Jesus is saying. They then have a debate about uh, what's he talking about and where does he intend to go? Uh, 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 and th this doesn't make any sense to us. Uh, uh, do you said, where does he intend to go? Does he intend to go to the, the Jews scattered amongst the Greeks? Is he going off to, to another country? Um, what does he mean when he says, you'll look for me, but won't find me, and where I am, you cannot come? So uh, the fact that the crowds are sitting there and asking questions, what did he mean, uh, is encouraging, because <laughs> so often as I read through the scriptures, I often think, what does he mean? I don't, I'm not sure I get what he's talking about. I have to think of this more deeply. I'll have to read more widely. I'll have to pull out a commentary to, to try and get my head around what he means. Um, uh, and that is where we so often find ourselves. Uh, and so this enigmatic teaching that Jesus gives. And then on the last and greatest day of the festival, uh, and there's some debate about which day this was. There's, it's, it's a seven-day festival. And so um, when they talk about the last day of the festival, which might be the seventh day, but there was a Sabbath that followed the seventh day. The eighth day was also considered part of the festival. So that might have been the last day. So rather than the counted seven, it might be that final Sabbath uh, when sacrifices were made. But it was the... Uh, when John says the last and greatest day of the festival, it's almost he's saying about the, the climax of the festival. When everything reached the, the, this point, Jesus stands up and says in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Um, the point is made that Jesus stood and says in a loud voice. At other places you have Jesus sitting down. When he goes up on the mountain, the Mount of, uh, for the Sermon on the Mount, we told, as the disciples came around, he sat down and began to teach the disciples. Um, so time and again, uh, Jesus would sit. And certainly in the first century, any teacher would sit and teach the crowds, which is where um, you get uh, a cathedral for uh, uh, bishops, because that's where... Uh, they talk about the bishop's throne, which is actually his teaching chair. And you have the, the link into Afrikaans where you talk about a katheder, which is a, 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 a lecture, uh, something that you teach from. And you can see that a katheder becomes cathedral. Um, that, that's where the teaching happens. Uh, so Jesus doesn't sit, which says that he's not, at this point, he's not teaching the crowds. He's appealing to them. He's, he's advertising. He's crying out. Um, and he's calling people. He, he's a, a messenger rather than just a teacher. He stands up and with a loud voice so the crowd can hear him. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Um, during the, the festival, there is a point where they would pour out water um, in the, the temple, at the altar, um, and from what I gather, it would run through a furrow and out into a, a 
uh, outside the temple. And so there's this image of water being part of uh, the, the, the festival and going from the, uh, the temple out into the world um, in Jesus looking and saying, if you're thirsty, if you're wanting water, come to me. Uh, whoever believes in me, uh, is sorry, let, let him come to me and drink. So he's offering us uh, uh, quenching of thirst, which links again to the story in John of Jesus when he meets the woman at the well and he asks her for a drink and she says, you, you're Jewish, I'm a Samaritan, you shouldn't be asking me for a drink. And he says, oh, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for water. He says, well, you've got nothing to draw from. He says, I can give you living water. Um, and the same thing, teaching sort of Jesus is here to give people what we need to quench our thirst, to give us the, the greatest need that we have. Um, it says, whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Uh, and so he's not just talking about a little sprinkling of water, uh, a trickle of water. He's talking about this abundance, this, these rivers of water flowing. Um, talks of living water. And they, the commentators speak about the, the Greek where they talk of living water is also used of flowing water, a water flowing in a stream, which is quite different from water standing in a cistern or getting stagnant in a pond. And Jesus uh, is offering this uh, fresh, uh, life-giving, uh, clean, pure water to, to be part of us. And it's, not, it's, it's interesting that it's, it says, and it doesn't say that rivers of water will flow into them, He's saying will flow from within them. So we're going to receive from Jesus something that will come flow out of us and make a difference in this world. We're told that by this, he meant the spirit. Um, so he's, he's saying, if you come, if you're thirsty, come and you will receive the spirit who will flow from you, not trickle, flow from you. Um, and take this life-giving, this living water into the, the world. Uh, and John has a, this, this text note um, uh, or this explanation. He meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Um, and we remember that John was writing this gospel decades later. So this was well after uh, Pentecost and the birth of the church, well after the scattering of people. This was probably right towards the end when John had seen the church spread out throughout the empire. Um, and so he knew that the, the disciples were going to receive spirit later on that was going to be poured on them, it was going to be a source of power within them. Uh, and he, he recognizes when Jesus said this, he's referring to that, that point where the people would receive the spirit. Um, and certainly as we see in Acts, Two, as the disciples receive the spirit, they stand up and they speak about Jesus and so many more people here. Um, and you really have this picture of this river flowing out of the disciples into the world. And he did, then has us know up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Um, and so there's a the clear link between Jesus uh, uh, work of salvation on the cross and the giving of the spirit that this the spirit um, coming depends on Jesus work of salvation and uh, which he describes as Jesus being glorified so until Jesus was crucified until he dis, uh, risen and ascended the spirit couldn't come and Jesus says that himself he says um, it is as well I'm going because my father will send another counselor. Unless I go, he cannot send the counselor. I must go to the father so that the spirit can come. Um, uh, and uh, the spirit would only come not just because Jesus was back at the father, but because he'd been glorified, which means salvation had been secured and 
the price had been paid and we could be uh, forgiven and united with God once again. And that is a great offer that Jesus gives, which continues down through to the, the age to, to this time. And then the people respond on hearing his words. Some people said, surely this man is the prophet. Um, in the Old Testament, there was an expectation that a prophet would be given um, to the people before the Messiah came. And in Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, we read of the promise. Moses uh, speaks to uh, the people and he says to them towards the end of his life, he says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. So he, he speaks about this prophet coming. Uh, and the people are saying, well, maybe this is Jesus is this person that, that Moses spoke of. Um, uh, the Pharisees had thought that John might have been the the prophet, because when John the Baptist was around, they went and said, are you the prophet? And he said, no, I'm not the prophet. Are you the Messiah then? No, I'm not the Messiah. I'm merely one announcing, get ready for the Lord. So some people say Jesus uh, must be this person. And others say, no, he, he's the Messiah. He must be the Messiah. And then this little debate happens again, trying to work out how can, is Jesus the Messiah or not? And others ask, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? <laughs> they were clear in their mind the Messiah would come from David's descendants from Bethlehem, the town where David lived. Um, and everybody knew Jesus as the Galilean. He came down from Nazareth. Therefore, if he came from that part of the world to way up north, he couldn't be the Messiah because the Messiah would come down from down south from Bethlehem. And we told the people were divided. Uh, and again, some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Uh, and now, as the people are divided and uncertain, we're not told that Jesus clarifies things. He doesn't say, oh, well, let me just explain again. He leaves them, uh, knowing that those who... Uh, the spirit would prompt whose, whose eyes were open would see him. The right people would see him um, and the rest he can leave. And sometimes we, as Christians, we present the gospel. And if it's people aren't sure, aren't, it's not our job to convince them and to force them and to persuade them. Uh, we, we speak the gospel um, and we leave the, the spirit to work in them. Uh, Right, the end of the passage and thoughts. Any questions or, or comments or ideas or suggestions or things that uh, you'd like to add? Uh, you just need to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask anything. Yeah. There we are. Hi, Ian. Hey. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much for this reading. Um, just a comment here, because um, I think I understand that really um, this is a gathering of Jewish people because it was the Feast of the Tabernacles. Yeah. But this one comment, I think, is very profound. You know, the, the Jews ask very, they, they ask a lot of questions but this one here and that's from um verse 38 does he uh hang on, sorry i read a bit mm, I'm my eyes. does he intend to um uh hang on does he in uh intend to go to the um dispersion amongst the greeks and teach the Greeks. Mm. And I find that the most amazing statement because this whole big scenario that's going on here is really to Jewish people. Mm. And here is one of the Jewish people um, virtually saying, is he not going to the Greeks? And is he not going to teach the Greeks? 
And then that reminds me of that one verse that um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the it's the salvation of the Lord to the Jews first and then to the Greeks mm. when the righteousness of God is revealed. So I'm, I'm, I just almost feel that that's, that's a, a, a sort of one of the, 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 the um, Jewish people there, um, the Jews, um, must have had this, I don't know, mm. maybe uh, a, a sort of the spirit of God just said to say that. I mean, here is teaching the Greeks. Yes. And that's what the gospel is all about, too. I just find it the most amazing statement. So I don't know if you've got any comment about that or whether I'm on the right track at all. I'd have to, to go and read because it, it does appear that, that they, um, it, it can be sort of, it looks like it could be two groups of people that they're, because it says, um, will you go to where our people live scattered among the Greeks? So going to where our people are, and teach the Greeks, so our people versus the Greeks, and so it's a it's sort of the different group of people that he'll go out to the dispersion and then teach the Greeks out there, or whether in their mind the the Jews that lived in the dispersion um, were so much part of that world rather than the the world of Israel that they were perceived as uh, the Greek Jews, almost, and so that way they they speaking of teach the Greeks mm. uh, that whether they are referring to uh, the the Greek speaking Jews of the dispersion. I wonder. I don't know. I hadn't thought. About I'm not that. sure. I'm not sure whether yeah. that, that would refer to Gentiles or to yeah. Greek Jews. <laughs> I, I have to read, look up a look up a comment, but it also do, does just so that this hint. Uh, early on already of, of the gospel being for more than just the Jews yeah. um, and to go out um, and to be for, uh, it's not something that's going to be kept internal in Jerusalem with the people of Israel mm. in Israel. It's going to go out into the world to the people scattered around the world. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Any other Thoughts and comments or questions? Anyone? Silent. I love that statement that Jesus was not yet glorified. I mean, it's just mm. so amazing um, to to understand um, how Jesus um, went up with his disciples. Um, I think was it to the Mount of Olives? I think I'm not sure, but where he was glorified with mm. them there. And now it was another another waiting to be yet not glorified. I, I just find that so amazing. This um, mm. uh, this whole statement of Jesus waiting to be glorified and glorified with, and he was glorified before that. Mm. And um, phew, I, I just yeah, it's quite mind boggling. I think mm. <laughs> just. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, the glory of the God is so often mentioned in in Scripture, and I'm just mm. so aware of this: the glory of God, Jesus being glorified. I, I, it just these these words just jump out at me, and I, mm. I, uh, I get quite overwhelmed with them sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting um, idea that. We, we talk about the glory of God and the heavens declare the glory of God and we think mm. of the glory of God and we always have that as distinct from uh, Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Yeah. And, uh, whereas when you talk about the crucifixion and resurrection as Jesus being glorified, mm. uh, it just makes a, a, 
far more complex picture mm. of of God and of mm. Jesus. That uh, the cross and the empty tomb display the glory of God mm. uh, as well as any of the heavens or any of the creation would. And you know what? Uh, sorry, I'm talking a bit now. Um, what really sort of, I think perhaps it was on Sunday, so where Jesus um, was preaching and that woman came up to him and just touched his robe mm. and he knew that the glory, the power had gone out of him. Yeah. I just, I, I actually, I, it, it's just, uh, to me, um, I think, wow, you know, um, yeah. it's just so amazing that, that he was walking around having that glory um, of God, because he was God, but it was just, it's, oh, I, I really, I, I think I'm, I need to understand so much more and <laughs> take it in my, my, my head. <laughs> yeah. And the interesting thing with that story, the, the woman with the flow of blood is, uh, the disciples were clear that there were crowds all around, all touching Jesus, all jostling with him, all pushing and bumping and yet none of those touches counted for anything. It was that touch of faith yeah, yeah. that the woman yeah. had that that um, touched the, the power and the glory of, of Jesus and made the difference. So profound. Um, it really is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I was, I heard something last night about, um, it's a little bit off the topic, but it's interesting for what, um, Jenny said, because um, the sermon was that Jesus didn't, he had power, but he didn't have authority until John um, baptized him. He went, to, he went, he traveled, I think it was mm -hmm. long to see John to get baptized. And only once John baptized him, then he had his power. And and then it was about it was saying that um, some of us have power and some of us have authority, but we need to be under authority to be able to to mm -hmm. um to to come into our power. If 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 so, we have to. It, it was just such a brilliant. It was, it yeah. was, uh, I wish I could post that. You know, it, mm -hmm. it was by Governor Miles, um, someone or other. Uh, yeah, okay. But it's very, very good. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, power, if you're not under authority, will lead to totalitarian. Yeah. Um, so you take yes. over. Yeah, he so was. He was, was about that. Yeah. You yeah. have to be under authority. Absolutely. Hmm. Great. Anything else? Well, let's close with prayer. As just before everybody lights go out for people. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you came, that you engaged with people, that you revealed your glory to them, that they could glimpse and see that you were somebody special, that you were the Messiah, that even those sent to arrest you could go away saying no one has been like this person. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I pray that we would um, see you through the words of Scripture, that we would be able to catch a glimpse of your glory, that we would be able to um, hear you speak through your word and be able to say to the world, no one speaks like this man. No one teaches like this man. No one has the glory that this man has. Um, and as we see and, and come to know you better, that that would change us. And so, Lord, we pray that you would um, let your living water flow into us, flow through us, Make a difference in us and make a difference through us. We ask this, Jesus, in your name and for your Father's glory. Amen. 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 Thank you very much.